In Big Timber State Park, a paranormal phenomenon is occurring in the cabin of a woodcutter who died over a century ago. After the stove lights itself, the woodcutter himself rises again, coming back from beyond with a thirst for revenge. As today is Fat Tuesday, he honors the American tradition of making pancakes before going out to terrorize his victims. Ignoring the danger they face, a group of teenagers is heading to the park, where they will work as counselors at a church camp. The newcomer in the group is a girl named Faith, and her quiet demeanor arouses general curiosity. Additionally, the boys cannot help but have impure thoughts in her presence, which provokes the jealousy of some girls, especially the wicked Danielle. Faith remains unfazed, and the two begin to trade insults disguised as Bible verses. Her attitude inspires the shy Jacqueline, who then decides to befriend her. The camp director tries to get the group's attention with breathing techniques. Being completely ignored, he loses his temper and tells everyone to shut up. He then says his name is Doug and promises free pizza at the end of the trip, but only if everyone behaves. When the bus passes by Dr. Peter Shirtcliffe, he asks the attendant at a gas station where that group is going. He says every year the church sends young counselors to the Good Friends Children's Camp, where they will receive a group of kids starting tomorrow. Hearing this, Peter decides to buy a large amount of ammunition, in addition to a package of pancakes. Already at the park, Doug explains to driver Leon where to pick up the kids next, stressing that he should bring them straight there instead of taking them to the casino like last time. With the entire group gathered, Doug introduces his colleague Teresa and the cook Reggie. The three speak with forced enthusiasm and treat the group of teenagers as if they were in preschool. The only ones who seem excited are friends Kendra and Courtney, the first on the roll call. Teresa is distributing tasks as she calls names, and Faith is next. Along with Jacqueline, she will be responsible for the volleyball area. Still very focused on the curves of the newcomer, Jeff and Stan do not even hear when the director calls their names. Another who clearly did not listen to Doug is the driver. Instead of picking up the kids, he decides to arrange a little recreation for himself and invites two professionals to spend some time on the school bus. More interested in their phones than in Leon, they do not know that the fearsome woodcutter is arriving with a stack of giant pancakes. One of them gets startled when she hears the bus door opening. The other says she is being paranoid, but soon realizes her mistake when she sees the masked man right behind her friend. With a single swing of his axe, he sends their heads flying. Leon takes a few moments to notice that his friends are gone, and he soon becomes the third victim. Then we see that the grill is leaning against the bus and what is drenching the pancakes is not strawberry syrup. On the volleyball court, Jacqueline and Faith notice that someone is hiding behind the hay mounds. Faith goes over to investigate and catches a boy named Ernie with binoculars. He says he was watching the birds, but his sketchbook shows very different themes. Ignoring their tasks, Jeff and Stan talk about the girls in the group. Stan is still obsessed with Faith, but Jeff thinks Courtney and Kendra are easier. Their break comes to an end when a staff member named Alberto drags them to work in the stables and even steals all their weed. Hoping it kicks in soon, the boys sculpt statues of themselves with manure and escape, fooling the foreman. Alberto is so agitated that he talks out loud to a photo of his ex. When the woodcutter arrives at the stable, he sees Carmenza's image in his place and even rubs his face in his beard, thinking he is smelling his muse's hair. Then Alberto says she must forgive him because life is too short, and the visitor decides it's time to demonstrate that fact. He lifts him by the neck and rips his head off. The two friends are still looking for Kendra and Courtney when they walk by the cabin where Teresa is changing and decide to watch the show through the window. Doug catches them in the act and threatens to cancel the pizza. Then we meet a park ranger named Lewin Potts, who is responsible for Big Timber Park. She is the one Peter will talk to about the camp issue, asking her to initiate the evacuation of the entire park immediately. When she asks why, he explains that the area is haunted by a dead woodcutter. Lewin says that this kind of craziness is quite common but regrets not having time to listen to every lunatic who shows up with such a story. She asks her colleague, Shep, to escort the doctor to the door, but Peter insists on showing his newspaper clipping collection. The news shows that there is a wave of crimes in the region every 30 years and the phenomenon always occurs on Fat Tuesday. Although Shep is quite impressed, Lewin becomes even angrier with the outrageous story and kicks Peter out of the office. But before he leaves, Shep sneaks out and proposes a deal. He wants to keep a meatball recipe that happens to be on the back of one of the news articles. In exchange, he explains to Peter how to get to good friends. At the camp, Courtney and Kendra are tanning by a lake. Always spying on girls, Ernie thanks Faith for the view, especially when they decide that bikinis are unnecessary. 
Courtney, who seems to be the only religious one besides Jacqueline, is a bit unsure at first. But Kendra explains that being ashamed is also a sin, easily convincing her friend. Hypnotized by the two, Ernie does not even hear when the axe starts cutting the tree next to him and only realizes something is wrong when it is too late. The trunk falls right on him, and then we see that once again the woodcutter has strategically positioned his pancakes. It's as if each victim is contributing a little to the macabre syrup. The attack goes unnoticed by the girls, and they decide to get out of the water when they hear thunder. Still far from them, Jeff and Stan are running down the trail when they bump into Faith and her friends. Seeing the girl so up close, Jeff changes his mind about the target and the two friends split up. He accompanies Faith to the cafeteria while Stan continues searching for Kendra and Courtney. On the other side of the park, Danielle manages to escape her duties to have fun with a guy named Trevor. She asks him to go get a cigarette and the guy reluctantly agrees. The sinister grill is right in the middle of the path and Trevor barely has time to find that strange before the woodcutter's hand lifts him into the air by his neck. Hearing the guy scream, Danielle thinks he is joking and gets really mad, saying she can see his movements through the bushes. Unknowingly, she begins to provoke the vengeful undead, mocking his way of hiding. Then she demands that Trevor show up, and is horrified when the woodcutter answers her call. There is no time to run before he comes to get her too, and grabbing her wrists and ankles, he starts bending her body until he immobilizes her and then goes to get a pancake. Covering Danielle with a towel, he seems to want to use her as a table, but gives up because she does not stop talking. In the cafeteria, Faith is using the famous JT Jepson batter to make pancakes. Reggie sees that she is improvising the recipe and asks to try it. Hiding a grimace, he says it tastes great. The same happens when Jeff arrives and, apparently, no one has the courage to tell the truth about their culinary skills. While Reggie looks for the gallon of missing pancake syrup, Faith and Jeff make a mess of the kitchen with an ingredient war. As other counselors join them, the fun quickly gets out of control and even flaming skewers start flying everywhere. When Faith gets hit in the stomach, Jeff asks their colleagues to stop going hard, only to be immediately covered in pies and purees. The same happens to Jacqueline as soon as she arrives. In the park ranger's office, Lou and ruin Shep's dessert with work tasks. She is investigating the disappearance of two people and, without realizing it, starts flipping through the newspaper clippings. Just to be cautious, she decides to investigate Peter and calls a colleague, asking for a brief report. Then she hears a suspicious thud very close to the room she is in. Already drawing her weapon, she goes through the entire office to the balcony, finding nothing strange. However, as she turns to go back inside, the woodcutter is standing in the doorway right in front of her. He pushes her with tremendous force, and Lewin flies far away but gets up shooting and doesn't miss a single shot. Even after he is already down, she gets closer and continues shooting, just in case. Certain she has eliminated the threat, she goes in and heads for the phone. However, her enemy is already on his feet and prevents her from calling for backup with a deadly axe in the middle of her back. Lewin drags herself back to the table with a lot of difficulty and begins to throw all the decorations she can reach at him. Nothing has much effect until she throws the jar full of pancake syrup that Shep was using before leaving. This affects the undead in an unexpected way, and smoke begins to pour out of him, who leaves enraged. Lewin screams in pain as she removes the axe and then faints on the floor. Finally, Stan manages to join Courtney and Kendra, who are rearranging costumes in the theater. Inventing a biblical passage on the spot, he convinces the two that the drinks are allowed. The three then party, and Stan even dresses up as Jesus until the woodcutter arrives, destroying the stage. He grabs Stan's head and starts banging it against the bulletin board while the girls scream and flee. Kendra ends up stepping into a trap and gets hoisted upside down. She begs Courtney not to leave her alone, but her friend says she needs to find help. Kendra continues screaming, and minutes later, the grotesque zombie appears right in front of her. This time, he decides to be practical and installs a tap on the victim's forehead, placing the pancakes underneath and simplifying the whole process. Still running through the woods, Courtney is hit squarely by a pancake and falls on her back. She is left motionless, and unfortunately, the woodcutter approaches and ends her life. Now, Peter has arrived at the camp and is introducing himself to the counselors. He calls for a general meeting and explains that everyone needs to leave because the park is cursed. Indignant, Doug asks him to leave and threatens to call the police. The doctor then shows the package of JT Jepson pancake mix and says that it is a box of lies. Jeff finds his crazy talk amusing, but the young Faith is very quiet and thoughtful. The rest of the audience is starting to get irritated with Peter. 
He then begins to tell the story of the park's curse from the beginning, on Fat Tuesday in 1892. Jepson was in the park when he smelled a delicious aroma that led him to the cabin of a humble woodcutter. His name was Nehemiah Easterday, and he invited the visitor to try his magnificent pancakes. The taste was so unparalleled that Jepson immediately saw the sale's potential, but Easterday refused to share the recipe, claiming it was a family secret. Driven by his thirst for success, Jepson drowned his host in the syrup pot and searched the cabin until he found the recipe inside a stuffed leopard. Peter says the rest of the story everyone already knows. Jepson became a pancake mogul and made millions of dollars. At that moment, Faith interrupts the story, calling Peter a liar. When Jeff asks what any of this has to do with their safety now, Peter realizes he forgot to mention the most important part. Thirty years after the betrayal, the woodcutter rose again on Fat Tuesday and roamed the park with a tower of pancakes on his huge grill. Dozens of people lost their lives, and only one survived. Tired of this morbid topic, Doug orders Reggie to kick the visitor out. Peter leaves shouting predictions and warns that if the woodcutter finishes eating the pancakes, he will become invincible. Doug celebrates the return of peace when Peter leaves, but Reggie seems intrigued, and Faith runs out of the kitchen. Jeff goes after her and asks what the problem is, but she just says she was scared by the story. Rejected by everyone, Peter is almost leaving when Lewin appears in the middle of the road, asking for help. All she has time to say before fainting is the word syrup. Seeing from afar that she got in the car, Shep appears to remind her to bring eggs when she returns. And it is exactly gluttony that ends him. Stumbling upon the grill by the roadside, he is fascinated by the size of the pancakes and does not notice the large woodcutter approaching from behind, who soon begins an attack. In the camp cafeteria, the counselors are also ready to enjoy their pancakes. Reggie apologizes for the lack of syrup and suggests other toppings, explaining that he couldn't find the gallon anywhere. Wishing everyone a good appetite, he bids farewell to the group for today. Teresa asks Jacqueline to say the prayers, and everyone is surprised by her creativity. Excited about the chance to cleanse her soul, she does not shy away and confesses the sin she would like to commit with Doug. The adults shorten the prayer as soon as they realize the unexpected direction of her words. It is only in the middle of dinner that Doug notices Ernie is missing. There are several other counselors who haven't shown up, but he only finds the boy's absence strange because he never misses a meal. His doubts are soon answered, for the next thing he pulls from the tray is not a pancake, but the flattened face of Ernie. Doug can hardly speak from disgust, and Teresa begins to scream when she sees what he is holding. Just then, the woodcutter kicks down the cafeteria door. Reggie drops the batch he was bringing upon seeing that figure. Jacqueline stands up and swears for the first and last time. The woodcutter's axe spins in the air several times before hitting her. Everyone panics and starts screaming. While Reggie holds the kitchen door and calls the teenagers, Doug hides alone under a table. At the first chance to escape, he shoves one of the youths aside to get to the door and twists the latch as soon as he finds himself on the other side. Reggie says they need to help those left behind, and he asks if the cook is crazy, making it clear that he won't open that door even for Jesus Christ himself. At that moment, the invader throws someone into the circuit breaker, causing the electricity to go out. When Reggie threatens to break through the door, Doug pulls a tiny razor blade from his pocket and says he will defend himself with that. But he quickly drops the object in fright when Teresa starts pounding on the door from the other side, begging her colleague for shelter. No one moves to help her, and the woodcutter attacks right there, removing her silicone implants, which fly out to knock out yet another counselor. As no one is left in the cafeteria, the undead starts forcing his way into the kitchen, and Doug abandons his post in a hurry. In addition to Reggie, Faith and Jeff are also trying to escape. As they struggle to lift the garage door, Faith warns that the woodcutter is almost there. Jeff holds the door for her to pass with Reggie first, but he takes too long to join them, and the enemy hits him from behind. Faith is very shaken to see her future boyfriend being dragged into the darkness, but Reggie shakes her out of her trance, saying there is nothing more they can do for Jeff. The two then continue running until they see a girl sitting on a bench, facing away from them. Reggie tries to warn her about what is happening, but upon touching her, they realize they are speaking with a pile of separated parts. To make matters worse, the woodcutter has already caught up with them, so the two run into the stable and try to hide. The light blinds their vision through the boards as the sound of footsteps begins to approach. They arm themselves as best they can and exit the stable ready to counterattack, but discover that it is Peter who is coming. He managed to decipher what Lewin meant in the car and explains to them the discovery. The syrup from the pancakes is the woodcutter's weak point, as it was where his human form drowned over a century ago. 
Reggie does not like the idea of facing that monster with a handful of sweetness, but Faith agrees to the plan immediately. They then find out that Doug has also been hiding there all along. He starts complaining about the noise they are making, as it could attract the villain to that side. Saying that they are all going to be in trouble and he will be the only one to escape, Doug runs straight into one of the traps scattered around the park and gets his body cut in half. Peter reminds the other two that the woodcutter will become much stronger when he eats the last pancake and then Faith grabs a chainsaw, determined to defeat the monster. Reggie asks why they don't use Peter's car, and the doctor is forced to confess that no more people can fit in his vehicle. Disappointed with the little help from him, Reggie joins Faith, and the two find the cabin where it all began. Faith shows that the grill is empty, which means the worst has already happened. Confirming their suspicions, the woodcutter emerges from the furnace in his most powerful form. Impatient with the amateurism of his rivals, he throws their tools out the window. Both try to counterattack, but they fail. Shep appears at the door, announcing that he survived and is ready to save everyone, but his excitement lasts only a few seconds due to the obvious presence of the woodcutter right next to him. The next savior is Peter, who enters the cabin speaking in an exorcist tone and unloads his shotgun on the woodcutter. This does not stop him for long, so Peter is forced to use his own plan and attack the brute with pancake syrup. Unfortunately, the sachet is very difficult to open. Peter resorts to his fists, resulting in a miserable spectacle. The woodcutter seems not to feel his punches and knocks him down with a single slap. Faith grabs the shotgun, but Peter warns her that it is empty. Lifted by the neck and thrown into the cabin, she finds the gallon that went missing from the kitchen. Following Peter's instructions, she covers herself completely in syrup before heading into the final confrontation. Using her last card, she finally reveals that she is J.T. Jepson's great-great-granddaughter. Blaming the woodcutter for her lack of business sense, she says she will inherit the entire family fortune, becoming rich at the expense of his recipe. Furious with the girl's audacity, the woodcutter charges to kill the young woman, but even though he has great strength, the syrup corrodes him before he can choke and kill Faith. Peter and Reggie are relieved to see her coming out of the cabin victorious. The woodcutter briefly resurrects, but an explosion destroys him along with his home shortly after. In the morning, the survivors hitchhike on the road. Seeing that they have had a long night, the driver asks if they are hungry and suggests stopping at a pancake house, but anyone after this terror would not accept the invitation.